have a mistress, not a master. It is my intention to astonish you all. They shot me on the left side of my head. They thought that the bullet would silence us. I am the same Malala. I always wanted to fly like Superwoman because I was so angry about how limited I was. This is my church. For the Vatican to step in and say, you're not doing it right. I mean, I have been a sister longer than most of those guys have been alive. I don't think that the classical ballet world will ever accept me. I'm black. I have a large chest. I'm muscular. It's not hard to remember what I wanted during the revolution. Freedom. Who doesn't want freedom? You didn't think you'd get a marching band at the Athena Film Wait, Festival, right? Ghostbusters! <laughs> so thank you. Thank you all for coming. We're thrilled to have you here. My job, is, as you've seen throughout the weekend, is to say thank you. I'm the official thank you person. And We thank you. We thank you. I mean, because frankly... This festival would be nowhere without all of you who come and have a great time throughout the weekend. There's a few other people we need to thank, particularly uh, Artemis Rising Foundation and Regina Kulik Scully, who is our founding sponsor. In our <laughs> Regina is often one to say how important it is that women philanthropists support women's programs, and we uh, agree with her 100%. Um, I want to also thank HBO Documentary Films and our bronze and silver and gold level sponsors, all of whose names you've seen uh, throughout the weekend up on screens. Um, and we have a great honorary host committee. We have uh, festival co-chairs. We have all kinds of people who've been involved in judging and awarding and all kinds of things. But the important thing is, you should know that we are eternally grateful for all the work they all do. And now it's time for a show. OK. Um, so this year is a really special year. You're all here. And I am honored to introduce a special person. Um, we have Kate McKinnon here with us this evening. <laughs> I mean, I'm 
I'm supposed to read her bio, but I, you know, like, I don't think the bio does justice to what this woman does for all of us, for making women visible on Saturday Night Live, for showing us the possibilities for being unbelievably fucking hysterical all the time, <laughs> to just balls to the wall. And um, I just want to appreciate you. She, lives, she grew up on Long Island, too, so, you know, we have that connection. But we all know, yes, I did grow up on Long Island. Um, she has entertained viewers with her critically acclaimed impressions of hopefully to be president of the United States, Hillary Rodham Clinton, <laughs> as well as other notable impressions, including Justin Bieber and Ellen DeGeneres. So, um, but, you know, she's going to be in Ghostbusters, that little movie that's coming out this summer, just a little bit of a movie. So I'm just going to bring her up here to introduce our special guest of the evening to you. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That was really nice. Thank you. I was not expecting that. Excuse me while I reach into my women's garment, <laughs> my brassiere. Oh, wow, what a room of um, mostly female faces, and thank you to the men who have braved this estrogen-laden event. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you, Katie and Melissa, for putting this incredible thing together and for inviting me to be here today. Um, I went to Columbia and I majored in theater here at Barnard, so I, I remember it, and thank you to this amazing institution. I'd like to say not thank you to the former security guard at the 620 dorm who was such a dick about letting people in if you didn't have your ID, even though... <laughs> He knew me. He saw me every day. <clears throat> um, I have stories. Anyway, on to um, the man of the hour, Paul Fig, is it? Um, Fig, Fig. Never quite sure. Um, those of you who know him know that he has dressed down today. He's wearing his pajamas. He's wearing, he dresses fancy. Paul Feig, dapper, kind, gentle, hilarious. My interest in him is primarily sexual, but I will try to stick to <sighs> speaking about him as an artist. Um, you know... Uh, Nothing normalizes the new quite like seeing it on screen. A culture can change its mind about something almost subconsciously after they just see it in a movie or on TV a few times in something that doesn't really call attention to it. And um, often the media slugs behind social progress only catching up when it's fiscally safe to do so, but sometimes artists will claw tooth and nail to present a progressive vision which then inspires reality to follow suit. And um, Paul Feig is one of these revolutionary artists. We might as well call him Paul Revere Feig. <laughs> that was a joke written by a professional comedian in the car on the way here. Um, I, I know about, I knew about Paul from being a diehard Bridesmaids and Heat and Spy fan. And then after looking him up on IMDb, realized that he directed some of my favorite episodes of television, never produced. Um, the Office, Arrested Development. Uh, the list goes on. Um, Nurse Jackie. Um, and then I, I had the pleasure of meeting him when he did me the greatest favor a person could ever do, which is to make uh, someone a Ghostbuster. If I, if I have, in fact, made the movie. Like, if I haven't been edited completely out of it, I don't know. <laughs> He's doing it now, so... 
remember that I'm being nice to you up here. Um, you know, we filmed it in uh, Boston over the summer, and the best part of the summer was getting to wear uh, a jumpsuit. And I wore pants the whole time, and my hair was up in this insane thing the whole time. Not one hair on my neck, uh, sort of like how I'm dressed now, like the opposite of that. And that was the best um, thing about the summer. And this, it sounds like a small thing that I got to wear pants and have my hair up, but it's actually... Um, a really big thing because we were playing scientists, women playing scientists wearing jumpsuits, kind of ugly jumpsuits, and they made dolls of this. <laughs> this is, th that, this, that has never happened before. Action figures of women scientists in jumpsuits. First time. No cleavage, dolls of this. And while we were filming, Paul would um, sometimes release pictures of how things were going and the costumes we were wearing. And then we'd get a, um, a wonderful email from him whenever someone would tweet back a picture of their daughter rocking a Ghostbusters jumpsuit in a proton pack, which happened a lot. Um, and it's, you know, it's sweet and it's cute, but it's also like, um, actually quite new and quite huge that something like that would happen. This morning I googled girls Halloween costume and I can tell you with scientific certainty that those jumpsuits will be the only girls Halloween costumes available this October that include pants. So <laughs> give it up for that. Um, Okay, I'm get, from now on, I'm on script. Paul has, so bear with me, Paul has let women be tough cops, CIA operatives, and lovable, drunken, flailing losers, among a lot of other stuff. Uh, Paul, but Paul's heartfelt and hilarious films have no political agenda. They are just wonderful, timeless movies, and he has certainly cemented himself in the pantheon of great, regular directors. Um, but his most revolutionary act has not been just in casting women as scientists and badasses. We've seen that before-ish. <laughs> no, his true subversion lies in creating female protagonists who are striving for the universal goals of friendship, connectedness, justice, and personal growth. These um, golden fleeces have always been the sole province of male protagonists. They don't call it an everyman for nothing. Um, and by building stories around female protagonists who are striving not for romance, but simply to become their best selves, he has permanently changed the game for us all. Okay, now, please, so thank you, Paul. Please welcome a man I'm proud to call my friend to his face and my new daddy to everyone else, Paul Fee. Kate McKinnon, jeez. Oh, my... What, for me? <laughs> Why, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my God, this is so nice. This is, and so breakable. <laughs> I'm terrified. God. Um, Kate, thank you so much. You, that really choked me up, and, and it, it's very, very kind of you. I, it, all I can say is when you see Ghostbusters, this woman will destroy you. She is so funny. <laughs> Talk about a force of nature. You're still in the movie, Kate. <laughs> now you're really still in the movie. <laughs> Do that lovely speech. No. Um, I, I'm, thank you so much. We're going to do a Q&A, in, in which I look forward to because I'm a terrible speech giver, and I apologize. Um, I just want to say first that just thank you so much to the Athena Film Festival and to Barnard College. This is, I can't begin to tell you how much this means to me, this honor, and to be the first first man <laughs> to get to do it. it. My whole life has been about, about funny women. I, I, ever since I was a kid, all my, I had a lot of bullies, and, uh, and I, I did. And so it always like, 
oh, the, the, the girls over here are so nice and they're so funny. Let's just hang with them and I don't have to get punched and called homophobic names. <laughs> and when you got a name like Feig, you know, it just comes with the territory. Uh, <laughs> And it just kind of grew from there. And I just find women so wonderfully funny and the humor of women is so just great to me because it's fun and it's supportive and it's, and it's not ugly. And, and, you know, guys can get very, you know, aggressive. I don't know. It's, it's, it's silly. I just, I, we'll talk about this too. I, this is such a terrible speech. Um, <laughs> I wrote something down, too, which I'll get to. Um, but, uh, but it just really means a lot to me because um, I, I just, I'm so committed to wanting to have portrayals of women on screen that, that they've been denied for so long. And it really came from just years of seeing the funniest women I knew stuck being the bitchy girlfriend and being the mean wife or, you know, and, and like all the guys I knew were getting to be hilarious and like, you know, I'd see there's Sarah Silverman pops up in a movie and you're like, she's hilarious. And then why is she not getting, have, why does she not have one joke and she's mean or Rachel Harris shows up in the, you know, in the hangover and she's just the most shrewish character you've ever seen in your life. It's like, what, who, whose image of women is this? And, it, and it's what I like to call kind of the little boy's image of what a woman is, which is, you know, it's either mom who's mean to you, and so well, we don't want to hang out with her. She ruins our good time. And then my girlfriend, she won't let me hang out with my douchebag friends, so she's terrible. <laughs> you know, and then your wife, like, you got to be home. And so that, that all comes out on screen, and it's a worldview. It is a view of some people, and it has been represented plenty, but I'm tired of that worldview, and I'm, and I'm tired of seeing these women not get to be funny, you know, to not let Kate McKinnon be a hero on screen and to be kicking ass and to be a smart scientist who's coming up with crazy technology and still is getting to be hilarious and have all kinds of foibles and, and, and just get to just be who she is, is criminal. And, and it's so much with all the other women that I get to work with and so many other women who I haven't worked with yet. I mean, you know, I wish I could make more movies and I wish movies didn't take so long to make so that we could do more and more. And, um, you know, but it, it's really important to me to just encourage Hollywood, encourage filmmakers I know, and encourage the studios to do this. I'm finally at a point in my career, just finally, where I might have a little bit more power, where I can actually possibly start producing movies. And so my fo focus has always been on in front of the camera and getting women in front of the camera, but now I want to catch up with women behind the camera and really start to, to get that going. And, and I'm trying to put together... Yeah. And working with colleges and working with, you know, to, to, to not only bring up new talent, but there's so many talented female directors who aren't working. And you see they'll do a hit movie and then they'll have one follow-up that's bad and suddenly they're in movie jail, whereas guys will get broken out of movie jail and, you know, or have more shots. And, it, and it's just, it's, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about it in detail. But anyway, I, I just, it, it's really now, I, I really want to make sure that we have parity in front of and behind the camera because, look, Women are 50% of the world. It should be reflected in front of and behind the camera. And so we're going to do everything we can to make that happen. Um, I'm not going to read my speech. Uh, um, so uh, I guess we're going to do a Q&A now. This is, aren't I? So I ended that poorly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you take a seat, Thank you. and then I'm going to bring up Kate is going to join us. And we are honored today that Belinda Lescombe from Time Magazine um, has given her evening to be with us. She is an editor at large of Time and writes about science, economy, and the insanity of relationships, those conducted at home, work, or in cyberspace. I like that. Since lots of movies, books, and TVs and TV shows are about that. She writes about those too. She's been at Time since 1995. We very much appreciate you being with us this evening and thank you so much. Thank you. So for you young people in the audience, Time Magazine is the one with the red border around it. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, comes on paper. We, we, and the web, of course. So um, I'm from the media, and if you were a woman, of course, the first question I would ask, Mr. Feig, is who are you wearing? 
Thank you so much. I'm wearing Ralph Lauren. <laughs> that I paid for, so I don't know, quite know why I'm giving them a plug. But. <laughs> so you're the kind of person a lot of, uh, a lot of writers hate because you write, you direct, you have acted. I don't know if we, I don't know if you're still something you're Someone's pursuing. Saying, yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> you've created a beloved, iconic TV show, a one of Time Magazine's 100 best TV shows of all time. <laughs> so I guess the first question is, did you always know, as the saying goes, that you wanted to direct? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I was, I, I really, yeah, I, I, I always wanted to be an actor, but early on kind of started seeing, you know, like Woody Allen and those people and go like, oh, you can actually write and direct and still be in front of the camera. And so kind of wanted to move my way towards that and tried that for a long time. I went to film school, kind of with the, the intention of doing that. But then as an actor, I was very limited. Uh, you know, I had this thing I could, you know, I'd be the goofy guy or whatever. And that was fun, but I didn't, I felt like I, I was seeing so many projects at the same time with, again, with people I knew in them, they weren't is good or those people weren't getting to do what I knew they could be funny doing and it was more that feeling of like, I think I'd be better off behind the camera because I think I can put make those people better and put the best them on screen and so, and, and I never look back and I've just been so happy ever since I, I, I stopped doing it. So. so let's get right into the weeds. Um, one of the things that we always talk about with women in leadership <laughs> is, um, no we're Eight. good, we're good, you can be the man. <laughs> No, 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 I think we're good. <laughs> One of the things they always talk about with women leadership is an unwillingness to speak up, so I guess. <laughs> Switch with me, Paul. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> um, is that, and this is true for uh, directors, comedians, writers, is that those roles uniquely require a, an appetite for risk a high appetite for risk. And one of the things that studies seem to have shown is that women tend to be sometimes more risk averse. And I wonder how much you think of your job as, a, as the leading man of, in, in, in this award is to sort of inspire confidence in women. Well, uh, I mean, it, it, it's more from the, that just idea that I wasn't seeing them portrayed well, and I wasn't seeing them get the opportunities that they should have. Um, and so that's really been my only goal, is just, because you, you see it happen, it's a self-perpetuating thing that happens in Hollywood. Nobody, in, there's no conspiracy in Hollywood to keep women out of movies and all that. It's just this, the banality of evil, you know, it's kind of, it's just the way, you know, oh, it has to be the man, and the, you know, I've had, I've had producers, you know, sit with me and go like, you got to be careful, you don't want to get pigeonholed into being, you know, a woman's filmmaker, and it's like, well, why, <laughs> first of all, you know, and it's like, but then they would tell you these business reasons, they go, these movie starring women do not sell internationally, there is not a market for them internationally, you know, other countries won't go to see it, so, so everybody sits around and goes like, well, I guess we can't do it. And I just got so tired of hearing that. It's like, well, why don't we try to fix that? <laughs> you know, and, and so, you know, especially when, you know, I mean, honestly, after Bridesmaids, I mean, The Heat and then Spy and then now Ghostbusters, you know, these are bigger movies that have elements that I knew could would appeal just on a movie-going level. You know, there's action. There's, you know, now there's special effects. There's all this stuff. And it's spectacle because that's what, foreign audiences will go to see. And I don't even know if they're like, I'm just not gonna see anything with women. And it's like, I just, I just wanted to figure out how do we make it irresistible? So they will go see this, and then they're sitting there and go like, hey, those people are really great on the screen, you know, and not even think about their women or not, and then maybe it'll start to break down that wall, and then we'll have more examples of, no, those movies do make money, so then they can stop that bullshit excuse, and you can finally get, you know, it, we can move towards parody, which is all we want to do. And, and so I just got tired of hearing business reasons and that for being the gospel for why you can't do something. Well, now that you've blown up that theory, um, <laughs> I was going to ask Kate, you, you are somebody who's obviously not risk averse. <laughs> You're up. Um, you, you get out there every Saturday night and you, I, I like eggs to the keg better than walls, balls to the wall myself, but... Um, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, thank you for that. <laughs> if we've um, learned nothing else today. <laughs> <laughs> and you and you are live, the most terrifying things in the world, live yet in front of millions of people who will be judging you on social media the next day. It's kind of a terrifying prospect. How did you develop that sort of mental toughness to be able to do it? Um, well, Saturday Night Live is, in particular is um, just horrifying in that, in that respect. But it also, the nature of that is that it allows you to experience something on a Tuesday or Wednesday and then talk about it with that audience a few days later and... Um, that's why the show is live, and that's why it's stayed fresh for 40 years. And um, there's no greater gift as a comedian and as a person who wants to talk about stuff that's going on than um, to do a live weekly show. So, oh, gosh, I mean, I still I get so nervous every time, but it's like I do feel like I get to connect with people about things that are that everyone is talking about anyway that are important to me and I get to say something about them and be part of the conversation and that is the greatest gift and so I just you know take drugs when I need it. <laughs> I'm kidding, I don't. <laughs> it, it, can I just say one more thing about cuz I realize I didn't I didn't hit the idea of the risk aversion with women, and I, I, find, I think that's a myth because I think humans in general are risk averse, <laughs> you know, and what it is is if you are drawn to go into storytelling, into showbiz, into this and that, you switch that side, you, you, that side of you is overridden by ambition, desire to tell stories, desire to get your voice out there, and the women I've encountered, I mean, they're, they're so balls to the wall, or, or your turn, which I like, uh, that there's just no stopping them. And that, to me, is that's almost why it's even more gutting when I saw, and I still see, obviously, women not getting the chance to do what they want to do because you see them so desperate to do it, as are men who are desperate to do it. And... So that's why, you know, so, so, so I, it's there. The passion's there. The people who want to do it are not afraid of it, and they just need the opportunity to do it. Yes, that's so how did you come up for the, with the idea of the all-female Ghostbusters? Uh, you know, it, it was, it, I was approached um, when I was doing Spy, first by Ivan Reitman, uh, who had his script that was the sequel to, to Ghostbusters for, to the first two, and I, and, and, I, and I was so honored they would ask. And then I read it, and I was just like, I don't know, it just felt weird as a sequel. It's too many years, you know, it's been 25 years, and also I knew Bill didn't want to do it, and Harold, who I knew, had passed away. And it just, it just felt wrong. And also, it's such canon to all of us in, in comedy that it was just like, I don't know if I want to step into that. But then they kind of kept coming to me, and then I, Amy Pascal, uh, when she was still in charge of Sony, unfairly fired, by the way, um, they wouldn't do that to a man. Uh, um, it was, you know, I'm telling you. It's, it it's a weird, I know. I'm not, I swear I'm not looking to get applause breaks, but it just, there's a lot of bullshit going on in this town, uh, in that town. <laughs> um, but she really pressed me and said, like, this is great franchise, you know, and I, and I love it so much. I was like, well, okay, let's think about it. Like, okay, it, it is great. Funny people fighting the paranormal with, with science is a great thing. So I was like, okay, how would I do it? How would I do it? I was like, well, wait, like one of those simple answers, you go like, wait, all the funny women I know, if I could put them in it, and if I just kind of rebooted it and started it again so we can have origin stories of these, these new women, that's exciting to me. And I called Amy, and she, within two seconds, said, like, let's do it. I want to do it. And, you know, so I really credit her for being the one that really, you know, jumped on board that. And uh, then we just never looked back. And, um, you know, we've taken, our, <laughs> taken, taken some heat in the, on the Internet, that fine, fine forum for <laughs> people who live in their basements. Uh, you know, and look, there's, there's plenty have legitimate complaints about a reboot and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, the amount of misogyny that, that t came at me, especially in the, in the beginning of it, was just really shocking and an eye-opener. And, you know, and I mean, you know, the, I don't know if you know about the whole Gamergate thing that went down with these, you know, these 
female I video think this game. Crowd, this crowd probably knows. Yeah, that. yeah, exactly. I mean, that's you know, not you hear about that and you go like, oh, that must be bad. But how bad could it be? Just the little bit I got on my end as a guy. It's horrendous. I mean, it is such, you know, the, the fact that they're trying to get the laws against this, they should because, you know, I'm all for free speech. But this, this is targeted harassment. This is, this is ugliness on a level I've never seen. And so that, you know, I don't know it, it's just, it, it's kind of unbelievable. You always have to pinch yourself and go like, wow, we're really living and now it's 2016 and this is going on. And the, the anonymity of the Internet just allows it to happen. So... <laughs> Did that, that, so that was a surprise to you, that sort of... It was a huge surprise to me, because I was basically like, when I came to the eye, I go like, well, oh, this is so great, like, uh, this will be, who wouldn't be happy about this? <laughs> like, like a, you know, lamb to the slaughter, and i got to write this thing out. <laughs> and what always happens with the internet is the first wave, the first day is overwhelmingly positive, just people are so happy, and they're so this and that, and then it's that second wave that comes in, you're like, oh, oh my God. And that first day when that wave started coming in, it's like, oh, it was chilling. Um, it didn't make me sad that I had done it, it made me actually happy that I was doing this because I realized there was a problem, but it's really, it, it, it is unbelievable what, what happens. A lot of it comes from outside of London for some weird reason. I don't know why, I'm, I, I'm British on my mother's side, and some reason Essex and Sussex and all, they, there's some really angry guys there. So, I don't know, maybe it's in the beer. I find it really helps to imagine them in their footed pajamas. <laughs> exactly. And their transformer sheets. That's what it is. <laughs> but sometimes, yeah, honestly, the worst ones, this was, I don't want to go on a tirade against the internet, but it's just the stuff that I can tell you from a year and a half of abuse is, you know, you go like, yeah, it's a bunch of like nerds or what, it's some like weird teenage boys in their basement. Half the time I'd go and I'd click on the thing because I always want to go see who the person is. As Katie Dippold says, it's always, it's, their avatar is always like a demon or something. It's <laughs> horrible. But then you go and it's like proud father of two, daughters. I mean, sometimes I'd get attacked by guys who would have, they literally would say two daughters and I'm proud. It's like, what, who the, get those kids out of that house. <laughs> and, <laughs> Anyway, but they don't, you know, they're, they're such a small, small minority that why am I giving them any power? <laughs> <laughs> so, Kate, the, the female players on Saturday Night Live this season have been so kicking it. Um, well, thanks. <laughs> And as a, as a long-time SNL viewer, whenever I see you and, oh gosh, I'm going to leave them out, Leslie and Cecily and Aidy and Vanessa and Isha Shia, when, when I see you come, I'm like, this is going to be so good. Um, and I wonder, uh, do you think the stake has finally been put in the heart of the myth that women aren't as funny? <laughs> There's that question. <laughs> um... I, I think we're about to the, we're about through the last ventricle of that <laughs> heart, yeah. Thanks to, thanks in large part to the efforts of Paul. I, I mean, I think Paul has truly, and I'm not just saying this to blow hot smoke up your ass, but I'm saying this because Bridesmaids really was a, a revolutionary thing. There was no movie like that before it. And I, I truly, um, you couldn't have women be the leads of a movie. You couldn't have a women's led movie that wasn't um, specifically a rom-com about a relationship. And there happens to be, you know, they do it in the movie, but it's not about, it's about female friendship. And um, that, had, that had really not happened before. I remember seeing this poster with all these women on it and just being like, oh my God, it's happening. We're, we're winning. <laughs> um, and I think since then you've started to see more and more of that. And that was really a watershed for um, female comedians. And I, I think it has trickled down to SNL as well. And my friends there are, happen to be very funny, and you know. Well, <laughs> here, here, and half of them are, most of them are in the movie too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Leslie and Cecil. So, yeah. <clears throat> was the success of Bridesmaid a surprise to you? Um, 
kind of. I didn't want it to be a surprise. Because, you know, you never go into a movie going like, I don't think this will do very well. You know? <laughs> but it, it had been so drummed into my head of kind of, well, it, it was a weird, I don't I, tell this as short as I can. You know, it came up, Judd came to me, you know, because I, I, years, like at least three years earlier, they did a table read of it. And, and Chris and I had cast in, in her very first role in this fine film called Unaccompanied Minors that you don't hear given tribute to here, <laughs> which, thank God, it's, it's, it's whatever, it's a kid's movie, it's a Christmas movie, <laughs> but, um, so I went to that, that table read, and I, you know, and I, through Freaks and Geeks and all that, I, it was so important to me to try to create really good female roles, and suddenly here's this table with all these women at it, it was like, oh my God, this is the opportunity, this is where we can put all these funny women, and we can find all these funny women and have this thing go on, you know, to make this movie. And then it kind of, kind of the project kind of went on the rocks for a few years, and then when it came back, um, you know, I jumped into it. And, you know, just that feeling of like, let's just, we got to do it now, I got to get all these funny women. So we did, and we get into production. And right when we're kind of in production, I started hearing stories from women writers that I know who are pitching female-led projects around town, and what they're getting from all the executives is, we have to wait and see how Bridesmaids does. <laughs> And it was literally... So no pressure. Yeah, no pressure whatsoever. So then I go like, wait a minute. So if I just, if I'm a shitty filmmaker and make a shitty movie about women, that means it's it for women. <laughs> they never get to be in a movie anymore. <laughs> and that's when you go like, that's how fucked the town is. <laughs> that it's gotten to this point where this is such a groundbreaking thing. It should not be a groundbreaking thing to put women in a movie. And yet the fact that it was... And, and, and it didn't used to be that way. I mean, look at the movies of the 30s and the 40s. You know, these strong... I hate the word... I hate strong female... I hate the term strong female role because it implies, you know, she has to be... I, I want good... I want great female roles. And you have these great female roles where they're complete equals to the men, you know. Like, His Girl Friday is one of my favorites. I mean, Rosalind Russell and Carrie Grant going back and forth. That's great. And those kind of movies, and you got Barbara Stanwyck and Irene Dunn and all these, you know, amazing women, Catherine Hepburn. Uh, and so, so I don't know how it got to that point, but so suddenly, so there we are. Sorry, I'm digressing all over the place. So there we are making this, and then it comes out like, so we're about to put it out. You know, we're testing really well. We're getting great tests when you test screen it and getting really high scores. But then, so the word from the studio is like, if it doesn't open over $20 million, then it's going to be considered a failure. Which is, now looking back, it's kind of bullshit because the movie only cost $32 million and now a movie will make like $12 million and they're like happy. Like, But some, they put all this added pressure on us. Like it had to be, we didn't have to just be like a hit. We had to be like kind of, for a movie that size, really blast through. So we, the, <laughs> so the week coming up to it, <laughs> We're tracking, which is the, how they kind of track how an audience is into a movie and if they're aware of it or not, was not good. So we go into that morning and, uh, well, they, no, they made a mistake to. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, so, so <laughs> it's getting worse. I know exactly. <laughs> They, somebody decided, oh, let's do, you know how when they open a, uh, like a superhero movie, they'll do Thursday night midnight show, or a, uh, yeah, Thursday night midnight show, and so they did one of those for Bridesmaids, which on, by all accounts is just a wedding movie <laughs> for ladies, and so it just did okay at the midnight screening, so suddenly it's like, oh boy, there's a problem. It's like, well, who the fuck's going to go out at midnight to watch a wedding movie? Um, so then the next day... I get call. They they can figure out like the first show. They will tell you like you're gonna make this amount of money all weekend. So I get a call from my agent. And he's like, "Well, the news is not good. It's looking like a 13 million dollar weekend." I'm like, "Oh God, really?" And so I'm kind of walking around in the state of mourning all day. And then kind of as the day starts to go along, I get called. Well, it, it might be 15. You know, that's like, well, it might be 17. So I'm like, well, okay. And so then Melissa McCarthy came over to have dinner with us, and so we're there with Ben and her and, and my wife Lori, and um, and suddenly the emails start coming in. Look like 19, and then it's like looks like 20, looks like 22, looks like 24, looks like 26, and we're just like, oh my god! So we jump in the car and drive to the theater and come in, <laughs> walk Before. in the back, and the place is packed and it's rocking, and it was just like that was possibly the greatest moment of my life because you're just like, oh thank God. <laughs> So. 
For a moment there, I thought you were going to say you were going to buy four more tickets. Just to- <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not paying for that. But. <laughs> no, the other great thing was what, why we were uh, why we ended up being such a, a success is we never dropped more than twenty percent ever weekend after weekend, which normally a movie will drop by half and then a half again, and so it just showed that there was such a hunger for seeing funny women in a movie that's not all about you know just falling in love and all that, and and, and so it did. It cracked the wall open, but I will say that the wall barely cracked open. Um, you know, the fact that we're celebrating, I don't forget what the statistic is for this year, there was nine movies or something like that with female leads, something like that, which that's great, but that's still embarrassing. It's still not enough. And, you know, we're, it, it's happening slowly, but it's just too slowly. And that's what I just, I kind of get, gets me bananas and, and why it's like we just need more people doing this, we need more filmmakers doing this, we need more female filmmakers doing it, we need more studios doing it. So so we're, we're getting there, but we shall not be patting ourselves on the back anytime soon. So uh, it's fair to say, I think, that some of your projects met with less success than Bridesmaids. And <laughs> Why, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you have said in the past that you were put in movie jail, and then you just referred to the fact that women have, you know, their jail seems to be a lot more secure. Mm-hmm. Um, and harder to get out of. <laughs> High security. Yeah. And I wonder if you could explain what you think it was that got you out of movie jail so that we could maybe follow that path? Well, it, well I'll tell you exactly what got me out of movie jail. It was, was my old producing partner, Judd Apatow, uh, who had the power, and he had this movie, you know, this Bridesmaids, which I had been kind of tracking, and, um, and he knew that I had a very feminine sensibility and, and loved female characters and, and said you would be I think you'd be the right person to do this and I couldn't get a job before that I was just you know I was back in television that was fine I was having fun on TV but I wasn't getting to make movies which is what was my dream my whole life so the fact that he gave me that shot that's what got me out and, and you know so it's just somebody advocating or somebody realizing somebody has been unfairly put away and pulling them out and so that's where it falls to I don't even say the studios, because the studios are not altruistic whatsoever. They're just going to go for the safest bet. They're going to go for whoever is going to make them the most money. It's, it's up to producers and, and, and people like that to go, oh, let's, this person did something great. And even if you go like, well, that, then they did a movie after that that wasn't good, let's talk to them. Let's sit down with them. Let's hear their vision for this and give them another shot. So, I mean, that's really, it's all about opportunity. That's all it is. Which brings me to, Kate, you, uh, Saturday Night Live is obviously a great opportunity. I think it was Chris Rock who said nobody leaves Saturday Night Live less famous than when they started. And yet, (laughs) and yet, it does seem to have been a better launching pad for the male comics than the female comics. If we look at Tina and Amy and Kristen, there are exceptions, obviously, and but those are quite recent. Is somebody in your position strategizing? What, you know, how do you think, okay, now I've got TK, however many years of Saturday Night Live left, and now I need to find a, a Paul or I need a, my next lawn? Like what, in the same way that Judd rescued Paul, is there somebody that you are trying, you know, are you looking for somebody? Is that, is that the secret? Um, well, Yes, I mean, uh, it, it's Paul. <laughs> I mean, it's a, by, <laughs> It's clearly Paul. <laughs> Paul, um, Paul did me and Leslie what they call in French a huge fucking favor. <laughs> but, Not a favor, trust me. <laughs> you did me a favor. No, but by but by giving giving me and Leslie this, uh, the magnitude of the opportunity that he gave the both of us cannot be quantified in this, using the numbers of um, this universe's math system. It's like, um, he, uh, yes, the goal, the goal after Saturday Night Live is both an end in itself and uh, an incredible job and an incredible practice. Um, but it also is hopefully a launching pad for a career in other venues. And um, yes, it does come down to opportunity, and you need 
uh, artists need patrons and artists need people to champion them and um, he certainly did that for me. And um, I just remember, I remember hearing that this was happening, Ghostbusters, and I instantly was like, oh, well I have to, that's the only thing I could be cast in because I'm not, uh, I don't feel like I could play uh, a regular, you know, gal in a rom-com, that would be a big joke. Um, I wanted to be a woman in a business suit or a woman in a, uh, a jumpsuit who's um, a real character. And there, I've, I read a lot of scripts, it's just not there. There's not, people are not writing women that are anything other than just, you know, normal, cute, Women, it's it's starting to happen more and more. But so I heard about this, and I was like, "This, I have to, I have to be in it. This is the this is the only thing that I could do." And so thanks. <laughs> Please, <laughs> let me let me just say, I I do nobody any favors. Trust me, I only hire people if they are awesome. And you and Leslie, my God, you are such comedic powerhouses. And, and uh, you know, thank you good. for thank you for gracing my little project with your immense talents. And Kate is the greatest person on the face of the earth. Too. She is the most loving, sweet. Do you want to go to the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Lori. <Laurie. laughs> I'm kidding. It's the funniest okay. thing about doing this movie, though, is trying to make you play yourself. <laughs> Oh yeah, we had. A, I was like, uh, Paul, can I use a Russian accent? Paul, can I? <laughs> what sketch character will I do in this movie? Because I was, and he said, No, you have to do. You have to play yourself, and you just have to act. But you're as just yourself. so funny. And, and I was like, Who is that? What What would that be? And it was a process of self discovery, but that's another conversation for another time. <laughs> You've had an incredibly productive partnership with Melissa McCarthy as well. How did you find her? Gosh, it was... I, the weird thing is, I, you know, I've been in comedy for a long time and have cast and looked at everybody. Somehow I had never seen Melissa McCarthy. Not a Gilmore Girls fan then? Not up until we... No, yeah, not up until we were casting Bridesmaids. I'd never seen Gilmore Girls. I'd never seen uh, the other uh, Samantha Who that she was on. And... And, I mean, it's crazy because, like, a comedy soulmate, like, you would think he would know. But we were trying to cast that role of Megan, and, you know, we saw a bunch of really talented, hilarious women for that role. And just kind of was like, I don't know, it's just not quite there, not quite there. And it was one of our last auditions, and I remember saying to Kristen and Annie, like, I don't know, is there somebody else? And they're like, oh, you should see Melissa, our friend Melissa. She works at the Groundlings. People line up around the block whenever you know she performs. It's like, okay, why didn't you tell me about her earlier? Uh, and she came in, and it was one of those religious moments where you're kind of like, she comes in, and she starts doing this character, and it took me like 30 seconds to even realize it was funny. <laughs> Because I had seen a particular, people did a particular take on that character, and suddenly she sits down with this kind of guyish thing, and she's doing this thing, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, that's hilarious. But then my first thing, like, that's so great, she's like playing kind of this gay character, and that's what, well, that's a really fun take on this. So they said, like, well, let's do an improv, because I always like to do an improv in, in the auditions. I said, like, let's just do a thing where you're trying to get her to go out, uh, you know, out of the town with you for the night. Okay, so she starts doing that, but it's, then it turns into the whole thing, like, we're going to go out, we're going to get these guys, we're just going to tear them apart, we're going to eat them up a lot. And it just, I'm like, wait a minute, so she's heterosexual, but she's playing, and then I'm just like, okay, I'm just in. I mean, that's, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> and yeah, and then, then, then we've just been, you know, just in, inspiring each other ever since, and, you know, talk about a delightful, amazing person and um, you know such an enormous talent so yeah she's she's the best how do you I know you we're talking today about women but I'm interested how do you position men in your movies when you're thinking about the movies you know the women characters have for years been the girlfriend or the shrew um, how, how do you do you do the same thing with the man oh, he's just gonna be the boy. <laughs> well I mean for me it's all about the main characters in and, and I got so tired of seeing movies that were always about 
for women, you have to pick between your job and your happiness. It's like, I know so many professional women who love their jobs, and so I just went, I, I don't want to see that portrayed anymore. So weirdly, if you notice, other than Bridesmaids, had a bit, none of my other movies have any romance in them whatsoever. I just, I have no interest in that for the character because I don't, that then becomes the motivation and then it becomes for the studio of like, you need more of that. So it's like, if it's just not in there, they can't even deal with it other than trying to get me to put it in. It's like, I don't care about that. You know, for the heat, it was just, I want to do a thing about two women who love their jobs and their biggest problem against finding happiness is they haven't found other women who love their jobs as much. And so it was about, here's these two women who love their jobs and now they're friends because they can relate to each other and they can sympathize with each other and empathize and all that. And then, you know, and then from there with Spy, it was like a woman who hasn't gotten to realize her dream because she's been held back by, by a guy who has taken advantage of her very sweetly by realizing she's so smart she can make him look great. And so he's kind of manipulated her into, you know, being his brains and he gets all the credit. And then there's a situation that happens where she gets to go out there. So for me, it's just about what is the situation that, that I can kind of tell a sort of coming of age or, or just, I don't, I don't what, it's not coming of age, it's just like somebody coming into their own, real, self-realization, if you will. Um, and then I just kind of fit the guys around it because, you know, like for spies, like, well, I needed some handsome guy who's going to kind of, you know, manipulate her. And then, then it's like, I need some, you know, overbearing guy who's going to doubt her the whole time. And then the amazing Jason Statham <laughs> comes along, which if you haven't seen the movie, you gotta, he's so great. Oh uh, my God, what, to put up with what we made him say in that movie. <laughs> It's really, I, I like to feel that guys are treated to the same, like the cocoa treatment from fame in, in my movies that women get every day. Yeah, the exactly. Hands. It's like, put this pretty thing on there, fella. You know, like, get your boobs out. Get your man package out. Um, and then, you know, I just want the women to be the strong characters in, in the, the, you know, the ones that have, have, that are our focus and what we care about. It is not, you know, like, no, but favorite thing, not the internet. The big thing, like when I was confusing certain people of misogyny because they were clearly being misogynistic to me, then they started fighting back with I was a, with misandry. I'm suddenly a misandrist. Which I hate men. It's like, I don't hate men. I just, I like, I gotta, you gotta flip the dial a little bit further one way before it then goes into the center. And so. We're going to take some questions from the audience in a moment, but I'm from Time Magazine, so I have to ask Kate. Uh, Hillary Clinton just took Nevada, if anybody is. She did. Nice. Wow. So I have to ask Kate if, sorry, when. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I'm off this week, so I wasn't reading the news. Oh, no, it just, it just happened. It just, just, just happened. now? Yes, it's today. Fuck yes. My little, me I have a media feed right into my brain. Um, if Hillary Clinton becomes president, is that good or bad for comedy? It's, it's great for Kate, I know that. Yeah, it's great for me. Um... Is that good or bad for comedy? I don't know. I, I it's it's certainly good for me because I'll have something fun to do for the next four years. But um, I think it's good. I think it's good either way. It's good for women. I think it's. Uh, I mean, I happen to agree with her politically, but also just it's it's the same issue of representation. If you see what's possible. Uh, you subconsciously even change your mind and change the decisions you make and how you treat people and what opportunities you give to other people. And so I, I don't think this is uh, a gendered election or it should be about that, but I do think that if that were to happen, it would um, do incredible things um, for gender parity in workplaces and blah, blah, blah. Do you... <laughs> Do you ever feel when you're when you're doing Hillary? Oh, that feels unfaithful to the sisterhood. Like it's that's too mean. How, how do you balance the needs of comedy with your belief in the powerful women? Um, it's it's a hard job because it, it is my job to make fun of her as a comedian who plays her. But I also um, am. A huge champion of her, and so 
um, it is it is hard to balance, and I've I fret a lot about that particular topic. Um, Have you arrived at any? It's a it's a case by case. It's a Saturday by Saturday thing, <laughs> and. Um, Comedy, I, comedy humanizes people. That's what I love about comedy. And, and you know, everybody gets hit. And then it's... Yeah, we, the, 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 the stance of SNL about politics is not that it's Democratic or it's Republican. We speak truth to power, is what my boss, Lauren, says. And um, I think that what I've tried to do with that character is, is to show her humanity. And having met her, I, I understand more how warm and... Uh, tender and human she is, and so I try to tap into that when I'm doing my impression of her. Does she ever overlap with Angela Merkel in the kind of... <laughs> well, what it, it's, I mean, it is sort of the same principle. If you imagine the inner life of any um, figure in power, that's automatic comedy because you think of them as these uh, stern robots who don't have... Um, an inner life and are, are not able to be hurt or vulnerable. And if you just display their vulnerability, that's a sketch right there. I should write this down. Wow, this is <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd love to open uh, the floor for questions. Just if you would speak up and put your hand up, because I think we can bring you a mic. And if you would ad- just choose who you wish to address the question to so that we don't have the embarrassing situation of two oh, people boy. talking at once. There's some over here, if people can see. If we can get mics over there. There we go. Um, while we're... Have we, have we got a question? Okay, yes. Yeah, do stand up. Hi. Um, oh, hey, oh, nice. Hello. So, uh, first, I just want to thank you once again for Freaks and Geeks. Um, and I've brought my script book. Oh, yeah. Maybe yay. if you want to sign Can it. Can I again. sign it? Yeah. Um, well. <laughs> and I, I had a sort of weird question. Um, is it sexist that I've nicknamed your movie Busty Ghosters? <laughs> <laughs> Only you can answer that question, my friend. <laughs> uh, you know, I. Just wasn't sure if that would be too mean or not. You know what? You can call it whatever you want. Um, <laughs> if it's coming from a, a woman, I, they can say whatever they want. It's when the guys, I, it's become such an insult on the uh, internet to call it girl busters, weirdly. That's like the, the, the greatest thing they can throw at us. Oh, I'm not going to see that girl busters. Like, all right. <laughs> and you're not going to see any girls in your life, I guess. <laughs> Another question? I think we have some over here. Do you want to pass the mic along? Okay, yeah, there, with the scarf. (laughs) Um, I just had a question, either of you can address it. Um, What is the value of adaptation versus just like starting new stories? So like with Bridesmaids, it was a new kind of story, like an ensemble female cast, but with Ghostbusters, it's an adaptation. So like, do you think the subversion is different when you're recreating something and saying like, here's a comedy favorite, watch these equally funny women do it better? <laughs> nice. <laughs> there we go. You know, I mean, that's that's, that's a really great question. Um, to me, it's all about what you think you can be the most effective telling the story of, and and it's really case by case. And wh- I don't like doing other people's properties in general, and I don't know if I'll ever do another thing like this again. Um, but it just felt like this is the such a great showcase, and it's such a great. I don't know. It just it just felt like I don't know. It, it just it would it was never a question in my head once I came up with it, and so you just really want the opportunity, the 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 vehicle that will give the the best opportunity for for your actors to really you know shine and. Um, but I mean, that, that, it's a really good question. I, I always, I'm, I'm in favor of original stuff, uh, just because I, I, you know, you also want to tell a story, you know, a new story that hasn't been done before. That's why I rebooted this, so at least I wasn't kind of stuck to the old world. And I know people are, some people don't like that, but it, I just like an origin story, and so it just felt like a great way. I just like birthing new characters, if you will, and, and it felt like a great way to <laughs> birth some kick-ass ladies. And there, and there's one of them. Come on. Okay, are there some questions from this side of the room? Uh, maybe here at the front in the grey. 
Hi, uh, this is for Kate. Will there be a sequel to Dyke and Fats? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Girl, you have, you have made me happy today. <laughs> Um, I can't actually speak to that. I can't speak to whether or not there will be an opportunity to do that. Um, I would love to expand upon that uh, premise. Uh, I, I don't know, but uh, props to you for uh, knowing what that is. Thank you so much. Uh, any, I think I saw one down the front here. Any questions? Um, we need to move those mics down. Um, uh, I th we've done sort of a lot in that area. I was hoping to give somebody it's down the front here. a chance. Yeah. Yeah. She's okay. Uh, okay, there. All right, that's good. I, right behind Bless the Bless your line. heart. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, Kate. Um, there's a lot of the members of the Varsity Show here today, uh, which we know... <laughs> The, the rabble awakens, um, which we know you were in, and we looked to you as a shining beacon of hope. Um, for both of you, um, you've spoken about how difficult it is to kind of, as female performers, to break into, create opportunities for yourself when you're already kind of known in the industry. Um, would you have any advice for how to make these opportunities for yourself when you're kind of like an unknown college age performer writer? Mm. <laughs> well. Um, I, congrats, I hope the show is going well. Uh, it's great. It's great on you. Um, I, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta do it. You gotta, you gotta go to, you have to go to UCB or you have to go to Second City or go to the Groundling specifically. I mean, if you're a comedian and just, uh, pound your ass, you just have to just, just do it so much and just keep, uh, creating so much because you need to figure out what your deal is and you can only do that after years of um, trying to do other people's deals and failing at it. Yeah, I, I, can I, if I can add to that, there's never been a better time in this Earth's history to showcase, to have the opportunity to showcase yourself because like you say, UCB and all those places. First of all, those are places that like casting people go to, and you know, and you know, the executives from my company are always there, kind of looking for people. But with the internet, with you know, with an iPhone, you can make something that looks better than something I spent thirty thousand dollars on, you know, twenty years ago trying to make my own first feature, and you know, and and it will get out if it's good, it will get out there, and. The, I cast in the heat. There was a, a this kid named Spoken Reasons, and I cast him because I'd seen his YouTube channel, and he made me laugh so much. I was like, I'm gonna put him in a movie. And suddenly he's sitting across from Sandra Bullock. I mean, there's you got a million opportunities, and what you and you're right. You just need to do it and do it and do it. You have to increase the opportunities that people are gonna see you doing something because it's always the one thing you don't think they're gonna see you doing on the one night that's weird or the one thing you did. That's the one that they see. So make sure everything you do is good, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but but just keep doing it because uh, it, cream does rise to the top. Can I just throw in a question here? On the other side of the camera, you just spoke about this before. How how do we get more women? You know, we have now I think a, a, a new TV pilot season where I think one one, yeah. one, one woman, yeah. pilot picked up was uh, had you know had a woman writer. How right, do we yeah. get more? women on that side. Is there some, some similar advice you can give to the people out here who are trying to get into that end of the business? Well, again, if you just start making stuff, because that, you know, it, it's the work that proves itself, but then, this, I mean, this is, a, this is a big issue and a big topic, and, and, and there's no easy answers for it. I think, I do think one of the best things happening in Hollywood right now is this class action lawsuit against the studio. <laughs> Because again, there is no altruism in Hollywood, and so you need to legally force them to do it, which is ridiculous that it comes to that point, but it's because, you know, there's a pool of people that the, the, the studios consider to be viable as directors. And obviously there's an enormous pool of men and there's a tiny pool of women. It doesn't mean there's not women directors, there's a lot of women directors, but they are not giving, being given that stamp of being viable to the studio. So then when, you, you know, when you're putting together a movie, uh, you, you don't just go like, I'm just gonna hire whoever. You go, I gotta meet with a bunch of people and I gotta hear their take on this and I gotta make sure we're in sync. So what happens? You go like, okay, we're gonna see 
all these people. Well, there's eight people over here, the men, that we think are good, and oh, there's like a woman or two women over here that maybe you know, did a movie that we think is right too. So, all the, so then those people come and pitch their take. The odds are much lower that you're, that you're gonna connect with the two versus out of the pool of eight. And that's what the problem is. I'm not an affirmative action guy or anything. It's like, it's all, you know, you need the person who has the right creative voice, but you need the pool to be equal so that the, the possibility is equal that you will pull from that pool or that pool. And that's why you need something like this class actually lost and you need to get people to just start giving people those opportunities so that then they can prove themselves and fail or succeed on their own. You know, nobody gets a rubber stamp. Nobody should be given a job if they're not worthy of it, but they should be given the opportunity. And that that's, that's it, but it's gonna, you know, it's a slow attrition of <laughs> this happening. Are you seeing more women coming up through the ranks doing the second AD or those kind of roles that would get them to the? Yeah, I mean, the, there there's always been, I mean, you know, there, there's always, there's a lot of women working in crews and all that. That's what's what's great, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that those. I, I don't. I, you don't know what people's ambitions are, and, and I know first and second ads who don't want to direct. I know others who desperately want to direct. But it's it's really it's more about who is driven to do it, who and who is just going to blast through with that ambition to make it happen. Those are the people you want to get. The opportunity, because you know, it's like, it's like it, it, who's a, I think Sarah Silverman said, like when somebody comes up to her and says, like I'm thinking of writing a script, I'm thinking to do this, she's go like, you're never going to do it. If you're saying I'm thinking about it, you're never going to do it. It's this the industry is driven by you got to have such a thick skin and you have to have so much ambition to put put up with the years of getting knocked down and, and not getting the role and not getting the opportunity. And so you know, but, but once those people those people get out there, then they need to be given opportunity. We have time for one more question. Um, the first hand I saw was I right hope there. I hope it's a good one. <laughs> In the aisle, a lady. Yeah, could be a lady. Hi, um, my name is Agunda Okeo. Um, I'm a writer and producer here in New York, and um, I actually produced the only all black women comedy show at any of the top clubs in New York City, the comedy clubs. Uh, it's called Sisters of Comedy, and I now just got it at Caroline's on Broadway after working on it for a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, my, my question actually, it can be to both of you, but I was thinking uh, with you, Paul, particularly um, one of the things which, because the show's growing and I'm preparing to tour it and, and I've already seen just from being someone who's been in the clubs for a couple years and just been part of the behind the scenes, I'm more of a behind the scenes club person, that um, I know that it's, it's affecting the, the zeitgeist. You know, there's, there's oh, so many wonderful women of color doing comedy and I can see there are more shows popping up in different spots and stuff like that. And I can't help but think that some of my hoot spots also kind of helped <laughs> to uh, kind of make it normalize it. You know yeah, what I mean? As, yeah. um, because uh, from what I know, it's like 20 years since Caroline's had um, an all black women comedy show there, from what I understand. So, yeah, well done. Um, so uh, what I'm curious about is um, how do you balance between like the art, which is really what I'm just trying to do, and, and then the fact that you do kind of have to, you are pushing an agenda because you're trying to disrupt, you mm -hmm. know? So I'm just wondering your perspective on that. Um, I mean, for me, the only political act is the decision to do it. And then after that, I like to drop it because I think anything that has a, an agenda written in it distances people because it's too preachy and the, too much, you know. For me, the political act, and it, I, I, I hate to say it was a political act. It was just, it's what I respond to. But putting four women in Ghostbusters, that's it. And I'm, you know, that's, that's all the agenda anybody had. It's just like, I have all these funny women. I think they'd be great in this. And then you step away from it. And, and I think it's just, it's really just, the art is the only thing that will carry it. We can make all, that's why, you know, I, look, I'm a comedy guy. And I'm always, like, trying to make, get these female directors to think more about comedy. Because... I just think that's the universal language. If you make people laugh, you can slip anything in you want, but you have to do it very gently and you have to not make it apparent. But people aren't gonna go see something because they have to go see it because it's important. Everybody will say they will, they won't. You get those screeners that show up, you know, when you're voting for the Oscars or whatever, and you're like, oh, I hear this is such an important movie. I'm going to watch this later because it's long and it doesn't sound very fun. You know, and look, and that, sadly, that's kind of how people process things. And so I think, you know, what you're doing is awesome because it's funny and, and, it, and it's great and it's an empowering thing. And that has to carry the day. That... It, our only job 
is to entertain people, and everything else is secondary to that. And when you're entertaining them, then you can make them think and do all that. But if they're not entertained, they're not going to enjoy it. They're not going to come. And and we don't want to make homework. We want to we want to make people have a good time because I, you know, I, you never want to put down somebody for you know when people. You know, my, you know, the comedy business were very opinionated and like, go, like, like, watch that sitcom. That's so stupid. Who are the dummies that watch that? It's like, you know, fuck you. Those, these are people that work all day and they come and they go, I want to watch something that's just funny and I want something brainless. That's completely valid. There's no problem with that person watching that. So who are we to say, like, screw them? What's nice is to go, like, maybe let's give them something that will make them feel that way that then is a little more elevated or is going to have something more. They're going to learn something. They're going to see people of color and go, like, oh, that's, a, you know, it's not going to be an issue. It's all about normalizing that. You know, for me, it's about with these movies. Guys look, for, throughout history, guys look at a poster with women on it. They go, like, it's a chick flick. It's a chick flick. But to me, that's the dirtiest term in the world. I hate the term for chick flick because it's an excuse for people to not watch something. And... <laughs> And so it's just about getting it out there. And so they go like, oh, my God, look, at I saw that show with, you know, these, these women of color and they're so funny. Then it's not, in, it becomes less of an issue because someone has gone like, no, look, it's, it, it's fun. So keep doing what you're doing. I think it's awesome. Congrats. On, on that note, I'd like to uh, thank Kate and Paul for coming, and I'd like you all to put your hands together one more time for the Athena Film Festival yeah. leading man, Paul Fee. Kate McKinnon.